Hey guys, this is Drew coming to you again with the Our Sword Bible Blog, and we are continuing our study on the book Steps to Christ, and we're going to be reading page two. Uh, forgive me if I look down reading or look up at my computer, which is behind my camera here, just to read verses. Um, anyways, um, we're going to go ahead and continue where we left off last time. Um, we left off where we read... Um, that even though there is a lot of evil that has come in the world because of sin, uh, there are still many good things that uh, nature reveals to us about God. It says, In nature itself are messages of hope and comfort. There are flowers upon the thistles, and the thorns are covered with roses. God is love is written upon every opening bud, Upon every spire of springing grass, the lovely birds making the air vocal with their happy songs, the delicately tinted flowers in their perfection perfuming the air, the lofty trees of the forest with their rich foliage of living green, all testify to the tender, fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. If you go with me to Genesis chapter 2, we find that in the Bible we see that God is so concerned about us, about you and about me. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, uh, in verse 9, actually we can start in verse 8, it says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't know if you noticed, but it said something specific about the trees that he made. It says that they were pleasant to the sight. Now, what does that tell us about God? It tells us that he didn't just create trees, but when God made them, he wanted them to be beautiful to us. In other words, he was interested in what we thought about the world that he made, and he wanted us to be happy in it. He wanted to create something that um, would fill us with joy when we look around, and he wanted to make us happy. It also says that he created food that would be good, not food that would cause us pain and suffering like the food that we have today. But he created food that we would enjoy that would taste good and be pleasant and it just goes to show you know with every parent uh, I know that I own a house and I'm constantly wanting to make it look nice to for my family to look at and you know, we like pleasant things and um, one of the greatest joys that a father has is providing a meal that your kids just relish and enjoy and uh, gobble up at the table and so, when we see God making good food for his children, it just helps us to see that God is interested in our well-being. It continues to say, The word of God reveals his character. He himself has declared his infinite love and pity. When Moses prayed, Show me thy glory, the Lord answered, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. This is his glory. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He is slow to anger and of great kindness, because he delighteth in mercy. We noticed last time that the reason that this book starts out with the chapter, God is Love is because we notice in Genesis chapter 3 that after God had made everything good, we see an enemy coming in and saying that everything was not good and that God was actually trying to withhold man from his highest state. He said that God was unloving and selfish and severe and exacting by keeping man from a knowledge of good and evil, keeping him from his full potential, restricting his freedoms to only what God says he can have. 
And so we see this contrast between God saying, I'm giving you freedom, I'm giving you all this good stuff, but stay away from this one thing because it will harm you. We see another saying, don't listen to God because he's lying to you and he's actually harming you by saying he's trying to protect you. And so we have this confusion. We have these conflicting sides. And it leaves one to ask, who do we believe? How do we know who's telling the truth? Well, we noticed that the Bible says that everything was good until sin. And when the curse came, we notice that that's when sorrow entered. And so we see that God didn't create sorrow. It was actually sin that created sorrow, not God. Now, after this first event with the devil, Satan, accusing God of being opposite of what he says he is and bringing in all this confusion, um, what we notice in the Bible is as we look for this theme of this great controversy, this battle between um, Satan and God, each telling their side of the story and not knowing which side is telling the truth, what I want you to notice is that Satan continued to make God look like an evil being, and he led men to think that he is unmerciful and unloving. I want you to notice an interesting passage in the book of Ruth. See, what had happened was Ruth, or actually Naomi, excuse me, um, had just had her sons die. And she is very so sad over this. And I want you to notice what she says. It says in Ruth chapter 1, verse 20, But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Do you notice that the sufferings and the trials that Naomi went through, she was led to believe that God was the source of these sufferings. The same thing that we see Satan leading um, men to believe in the Garden of Eden. She was led to believe that the death of her sons and her trials and that she went out trying to serve the Lord and she came back afflicted and bitter, instead of looking at God as the one preserving her and giving her hope and trying to work out good um, and seeing Satan as the enemy which caused the destruction, Satan led her to believe that it was God who was afflicting her. We also have an interesting story in the book of Numbers. Um, this actually took place before what we have with Ruth. But in Numbers chapter 13, Israel was just about ready to leave or enter the promised land and leave the wilderness. And they sent out spies into the land. The Lord said, don't be afraid. I will be with you. I will deliver them into your hand. But I want you to notice what the report said when the men, the spies, came back from the land of Canaan. It says here in verse 31 of Numbers 13, But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Chapter 14, verse 1 says, So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. Now what I want you to notice is what they said was the cause of all this suffering and affliction. Instead of looking at the evil report that Satan was leading these men, forgetting what God had said that he would be with them, notice what they said in verse 2. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? 
Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. And so very clearly we see that throughout the early history of Israel, Satan was leading men to look at God as severe, as a harsh judge, wanting to destroy people, just looking for opportunities to kill and to wreak havoc and annihilate God's people instead of being the loving, kind God that he says he is. And they were just, you know, eating this bait from Satan, you know, hook, line, sinker, fisherman, boat, uh, fishing pole, rod, um, bait, tackle, and everything. They were eating all of it, and they were completely missing the fact that it was Satan. They're missing the big picture of the great controversy. Now, if we go to the New Testament, I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul grasped this idea of the God of this world, Satan, blinding the eyes of men, um, leading them to look as God as severe and harsh. Notice this. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. So what did he do? God, the everlasting, infinite, eternal, loving God, the creator of every good gift and every good thing, as James chapter 1 and verse 17 says, who is looking to prosper his people, to make them good and to bless them, and to save them from their sins, um, the God of this world, Satan, is blinding them so that they can't receive the gospel. And they're looking at God as a destroyer. Notice this. It says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. Notice verse 6. It says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so what does that mean? What it means is that God sent Jesus Christ into our world to reveal to us the glory of God, his character, his goodness, as we read from Ellen White in this book just a little while ago that he is infinite in goodness and mercy and that he delighteth in mercy and that he's slow to anger and we see this when we look at the life of Jesus in the Gospels and Jesus came so that he could reveal to us that God is good and that God is love because when we see Jesus we see what God is like because he says if you've seen me you have seen the Father and Jesus went around, and to those who believed, every person in entire villages was healed. Even if it was their sins that brought the evil upon them, they still were led uh, to healing and mercy, compassion and forgiveness. And notice 1 John 1, 5. Again, we see very clearly why Jesus came. It says here, this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. In other words, Jesus came to teach us that God is only good and only loving, and that there is no evil in darkness at all. Now, I want you to notice that Ellen White grasped this idea. She says, God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth, through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, he has sought to reveal himself to us. Yet these but imperfectly represent his love. Though all these evidences have been given, the enemy of good blinded the minds of men, so that they looked upon God with fear, that they thought of him as severe and unforgiving. Do you notice she's just talking about the very verses we just read, such as, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, she says, He blinded the eyes of men. We read that from Paul. Satan led men to conceive of God as a being whose chief attribute is stern justice, one who is a severe judge, a harsh, exacting creditor. He pictured the Creator as a being who is watching with jealous eye 
to discern the errors and mistakes of men, that he may visit judgments upon them. Now notice this. It was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. That sure sounds a lot like 1 John 1 5, doesn't it? That this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's just another way of saying it was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. May the Lord be with you, and as you study the Bible, learn to read through the, gl the glasses of the great controversy and look to see whose side is really telling the truth. And I think that if you look closely, you'll notice, as I have, that Jesus is the one that's telling the truth. May the Lord be with you.